same kind of numbers. Don't you believe this election is really over? No, I just, I can't bring myself to say anything of that, of that kind. I call it a fixation I have. A traumatic shock created by President Dewey. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I'm looking for the end of it, but. Uh, what are you being told as to how it's, it looks in the various states at this point? Well, the. Uh, our own pollsters keep uh, saying that there hasn't been much movement uh, in the polls at all. So uh, I can say that it looks good from here, but uh, I'm not going to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. I won't predict. Mr. President, the press and the public all seem to agree, or most of them seem to agree, that you won the second debate fairly convincingly. Given the fact that the Louisville debate didn't go, go quite as well, did you feel a lot of pressure to do well going into Kansas City? Well, of course you, you feel pressure about something of that kind. You realize that, uh, uh, you know, that a great many people are looking and making a judgment and all. The, uh, I'll tell you something about both debates, though, that I've, I've wondered about, a format of that kind, maybe in addition to the panelist and the moderator, there ought to be a couple of referees who uh, have access to the facts because uh, it was a debate in which someone could make an outlandish statement and, uh, and get away with it, uh, uh, particularly if that outlandish statement was made uh, after it finished your rebuttal. You're not suggesting that you made any outlandish statements, I oh, suppose, Of course not. <laughs> Was there a moment in that debate, Mr. President, the second debate, where you, you kind of knew you had it licked, where you knew that you had won it? And if so, Oh, no, I, you know, it's, uh, the game is still going until the, <laughs> until the gun sounds. And uh, no, I, I thought in this one that I, uh, well, I wasn't making a mistake that I made in the first one. I tried in the first one to everything that I'd heard that I knew was not factual, I tried to rebut it. And uh, what that did was suddenly put me into a, a kind of, uh, he was calling the shots in that uh, I was responding to everything he'd said, uh, in, even neglecting at that point some of the questions asked of me. And uh, I just realized that uh, that because there was no referee to say, well, he's right and you were wrong, uh, I didn't get any credit for the fact that I corrected some misstatements there. Now, you were obviously expecting that question about age. Uh, where did you get that one-liner? No, that just, <laughs> that just came out. <laughs> were you concerned at any point that age might become a dominant issue in this campaign? Not really. They've tried for so long, uh, and so many years back, to make it an, an issue, and uh, uh, besides, I don't, I don't feel that old. Um, debates now seem to be institutionalized. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? Do you think the American public is, you know, gets a good glimpse into someone like yourself uh, through the, the debate format? No, I really don't. Um, I have, to, I have to wonder if they serve a purpose. Take, look at this situation now. Here are two, two of us. I have been in government now 12 years and certainly been a form of public life and uh, public speaking and so forth for longer than that. He has been in government around 16 years or so in the Senate and the Vice President. We've got records. Our positions on things certainly are available uh, if not already known by people, and then to suddenly say, well, now in 90 minutes, uh, we're going to have a back and forth answering some questions here in front of the people, and, uh, and this maybe is going to decide uh, the outcome. And I, uh, uh, I'm not enthusiastic about them. I... So you would prefer that they not be institutionalized, that, that they don't become a standard ritual of presidential campaigns. No, I think we've, uh, I think we've gone far enough with regard to uh, controls of campaigning and so forth, uh, to the point that pretty soon uh, it's, uh, 
It's going to be a routine rather than, it's up to the individual to go out there and do what they think is necessary to. What would you say to the comment that it's the issues are really irrelevant in these debates and that it's the man's style that really wins it one way or the other? And you have certainly benefited from that uh, assessment. Well, I would have to say this too. In, I think uh, some of the journalists themselves, your colleagues have remarked about 90 minutes that uh, based on style or something of this kind, uh, a decision is to be made about who should hold this office. Uh, uh, no, it should be uh, your issues, your philosophy, uh, and uh, if you've had a record, your, your record. So, so why, given all this, Mr. President, did you agree to debate if you had these sorts of reservations? Because I was quite sure that, uh, uh, very frankly, that it would be made a great big issue and that I would find myself defending against a charge of cowardice if I didn't. Feelings about the way this campaign is evolving so far. I mean, there's been some name calling on both sides, and your rhetoric has been uh, kind of harsh, really, since Kansas City. Um, do you do you think that's the way a campaign should be played out? Well, I would prefer the other kind, and talking about your own record. But when finally you've reached a point that um, so many outright false charges have been made. Uh, and claims of um, and promises, campaign promises made by the other side, and no attention paid to uh, what the individual's real positions are. Uh, uh, my so-called harsh rhetoric has been one of saying, uh, "This is the record. This is what was done." And. Uh, you know, to vote 16 times for tax increases as a senator, to vote uh, virtually 100 percent against any improvement in national defense in all those years, uh, including being, uh, according to statements made by others, opposed to uh, even his own president when he was the vice president, uh, who toward the end of his term uh, wanted to take some steps to rebuild our defenses. Uh, these are the things that I was talking about, and uh, in response uh, to that, I think the uh, there was something of personal attacks that were being made against me. Well, are we going to hear more of uh, of the kind of rhetoric, or, or let's are we going to hear more of the same sort of tone that we've heard from you this last week, Mr. President, the rest of the way, or, or are you going to go back to the high road towards the end? <laughs> uh, we're going to be, no, there will be some of that, but also uh, we'll be talking about our own ideas and our own plans for the future. But we had planned, and it wasn't any result of a debate or anything, we had planned that as that campaign went on and that if he continued with the kind of attacks that he was making, that uh, as we got closer to the election, uh, I was going to speak to the record. I could ask you to be Walter Mondale's campaign manager, though, considering how far behind he is. Uh, do you think he could have done anything else but to try to attack you personally? I can't answer that. I don't, I don't know. Um, I think that there could have been more about uh, what he intended to do. and. Uh, but he was at a disadvantage there since he wants to raise the people's taxes and no one wants that. Beyond what you've already said, Mr. President, what do you think about the kind of campaign he has, he has run? Is there anything, any other observation you'd like to make on that point? No. Mm -mm. What, um, what do you really think of him? What? What do you really think of Mr. Mondale? Oh, that's, uh, I think that's kind of irrelevant. In the, contest here. I believe that he's sincere. I think he's honest in his views. But I think that we have two completely different philosophies. And uh, his voting record is, uh, reveals that, that he, uh, for example, uh, his belief that a tax increase is the answer to deficits, when uh, I happen to believe that restoring the growth to the economy 
is going to result in far greater revenues for the government than a tax increase because I think it, tax increases were partly responsible uh, for the economic chaos that we were in. Government can become a drag on the economy and had been and I think has been uh, a number of times because of what has been the, for the last half century the democratic uh, economic policy. The growth in government spending, and you stop to think that uh, back along about the time when I was starting to vote in there that the federal government only took a third out of the total tax dollar in the United States. States and local governments took the rest. Now the federal government takes two-thirds and the tax is taking four times as much or more out of the dollar as was being taken in those earlier days. And we've had eight recessions since World War II. Uh, Mr. President, I don't if it's possible for you to take yourself out of this, but to look at what appears to be an electoral landslide in your favor, do you see this as a possible realigning election along the lines of FDR? Um, I don't think anyone could say that as of now, having been a member of the other party myself. I know how difficult it is to bring yourself to change. It's almost like changing religions. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so what I see right now, however, is a kind of a bipartisan approach in that people are crossing the line to vote uh, because they agree more with uh, the things that we're proposing than they do with the course that the leadership of their party has been following. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether that's going to result in a change of party, I know for a long time, after I had decided that I could not follow the policies of the Democratic leadership, I still felt an obligation to stay and try to redirect as a member of the party, redirect the party. So I don't know whether it could be a realignment or not. But aren't you, aren't you possibly missing an opportunity uh, to help to hasten that realignment, Mr. President, by not concentrating your personal campaigning these last 10 days in congressional districts? Your campaign said this morning that you're going to concentrate on, on helping Senate candidates and Vice President Bush is going to concentrate on House, House races. Doesn't that pass up a bit of an opportunity? Well, I have been trying to help in the, remember that the difference is that when you're the incumbent, uh, you do have a job to do. So campaigning is part time. But what I have done, and what I think probably reaches more people than say, uh, showing up at a fundraiser or something, I have I have done uh, radio and television spots for our candidates, for our incumbents who are seeking re-election, uh, done letters for them, and, uh, will cont and have continued to do that. And then every place I do go, why, I have all the candidates uh, that are not someplace else in the stump themselves on the platform with me where I can call attention to them and give them uh, as much of a plug as is possible. Um, in a Newsweek interview that will come out next week, Vice President Bush has suggested that his role and presumably yours would, might change in a second uh, term. Um, I, I think what he's implying is that you might be, might be less involved in the day-to-day -day activities in, over the next four years. How do you respond to Who, that? That I might be? Yes. Oh, no. I. I, listen, I, I really mean it when I say we made a new beginning, but it's only a beginning. And uh, the only reason I'm running is I want to finish the job. I want to fully implement what, what we started. But I also want to say this about, uh, uh, about George. He has been, I think, the best vice president that I certainly can ever recall in this country. And uh, he has very definitely been a part of the administration. I have always believed, I did this when I was governor and had a lieutenant governor. I believe that the vice president is like the vice president, executive vice president in a corporation, that uh, uh, he's not sitting on the bench waiting to be called into the game. Uh, he's in the game. Well, what about some of the locker room uh, rhetoric that's been in his campaign? What do you think oh. about that? <laughs> well, this is a little bit like my uh, supposed ill-timed joke uh, when I was at the ranch and doing my own radio show. Um, 
I think things that are picked up by a microphone uh, that, are un that it's unintentional on the individual's part to say them into the microphone, uh, I have little patience with people using those. Obviously, I think all of us at some times uh, uh, say some things that uh, we wouldn't say in polite company or uh, get angry and if we hit our thumb with a hammer, say some things that aren't <laughs> to be repeated. But uh, the only time that someone should be blamed is if they say some of those things intentionally for public dissemination. Then you can question their good taste. Well, I've never had reason to ever question George Bush's good taste. And, uh, We've asked you about one vice presidential candidate. Let me ask you about about the other. Uh, how do you think Mrs. Ferraro has acquitted herself as a vice presidential candidate? Well, uh, I'd rather not uh, comment on that. I think she has to be judged by the people on you know, the basis of their deciding whether she has the uh, experience and qualifications for, for that job. And uh, I'll mm -hmm. let the people make the decision. Do you have any other observations, Mr. President, about, about this campaign, uh, about the course of this campaign, or how does this compare uh, to, the, to the 1980 campaign? Any general observations along those lines? Well, you see, I've only had one previous experience with running as an incumbent, and that was my second term as governor. And uh, it is different. The, believe me, uh, when you're the incumbent, uh, and maybe this was evident in debates that you were asking about. Uh, you, were, you were being assailed and challenged. I have to tell you that it is easier to run as the challenger than it is as the incumbent. There is that plus the time element and the fact that you can't just lock the Oval Office door and go out there and say, well, I'll see you in November. You talk about being assailed, and as I think that the temptation for an incumbent is to re retreat into what I think has been called for you a cocoon. Um, how do you react to the charges that you're the most inaccessible president since Richard Nixon during Watergate, and how, you know, how, how do you plan to change that at all in a second term? Because they aren't true. And uh, all right, so I haven't had as many formal press conferences as some of the other governors have had. On the other hand, though, I have had regional press in groups from various sections of the United States come into the White House. Uh, I have had interviews like this, and then I've had them with groups of the, of the White House press corps. And I have had uh, uh, fairly regular off-the-record sessions with them so that we can just sit around and I can be free to talk and they can be free to pump what they want to know that's just for their own, uh, own thinking. Uh, I've had groups of, of citizens in of various kinds and for White House luncheons and so forth from all over the country. And I can't remember the exact number, but what is the number? You've had, oh, you've had 400 overall type of questions. 400 all, and if you add them all together, types of questions, that's, that's quite a few. Now, in toting up the formal press conferences and comparing them to previous presidents. Has anyone ever pr compared, did they ever do these other things that I've done? Or did they just depend on the press conference? Some people thought you were maybe a little rusty in that first debate, that you hadn't had enough given No, time. I was the one, it was, and it was my fault, I was flat. I was so filled with all the things that he'd been saying that I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't a fact and figure that I didn't have right up here in the front of my brain. Now I just had to turn and ask for the total number of those things. I, you know, you don't keep that on the right up in front or on the tip of your tongue. And I think what had happened is that I had just so filled myself with that that I knew I felt flat. Uh, I think it was like, what do they say about a fighter leaving his fight in the locker room? I think I'd done that. Accessible incumbents ever debated their opponents when they were 12 to 15 no, and, they on, and they only hang around here four years, too. <laughs> <laughs> As I recall, Mr. Baker and President Ford did that. They said when they were ahead, 12 to 15 points oh, in the poll. Right. No, that's right. No, no. 
concede the point. This is the, the equivalent point. of Richard Nixon or Lyndon Johnson debating. debating and right. you deserve your, do. your, your due for that. You took a risk. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, second term is really, a, you've called it a new beginning. Do you anticipate any um, major changes in your cabinet or your White House staff? No, I haven't queried anyone or I haven't heard any reports. We know that, of course, the Attorney General is leaving. He made that plain. I can only tell you that both with regard to staff and cabinet, I have always been asking people to come into the administration said, you know, for whatever time you feel you can give. Uh, never pinned anyone down as to duration, and nor did I in California when I was governor. Now, I've heard no references of any on the part of any of them that uh, they're leaving. Some of them may uh, feel that way and that they have to get back to their own businesses or careers, whatever it might be. But uh, as far as my wanting to make any changes, no, I'm perfectly content with, I think, I've got a fine staff and a fine cabinet. Um, in broad terms, if you get the mandate that everyone thinks you will from the voters. In broad terms, what do you want to do with it? Well, if I were president in the second term here, I would want very much and do want very much to, and that's why I'm running, to, to have the opportunity to continue with what we've been doing and uh, the main overall points of our program were the reducing of the uh, what the share that government is taking from the gross national product and which makes it a drag on the economy. Further pursuing ways in which with the tax system you can make it an, even more of an incentive for people and business and so forth for the economy to grow. Uh, making government more efficient, bringing it up to date, which it isn't in many business practices it's always stuck, struck me as strange that the federal government has the highest overhead, administrative overhead, for delivering a service or a dollar to the people of any echelon of government or certainly of anything in the private sector. And we're still whittling at the useless regulations and all. Let me give you an example of the type of things that can still be done. We put 62 categorical grant programs into 10 block grants for the states and local governments. In doing that, in giving them more authority and autonomy to set the priorities in these programs in their own areas, rather than trying to do it all from Washington as if the whole country is alike and doesn't have a diversity, in doing that, we found that we reduced to 600 from 3,000, the number of people at the federal level that have been dealing with these programs, but at the local level, 885 pages of regulations were shrunk down, federal regulations were shrunk down to 30 pages. Now, more of this to go forward, and then in the international scene, to continue, really the drive for peace and our whole military buildup, which has been talked about so much in this campaign, is only part of a dual track. The other part of that dual track is arms reduction, bringing the Soviet Union to the table. And I want to pursue those two, and I still want to pursue the idea of being able to rid the world of nuclear weapons entirely. I think we save, save the rest yeah. for later. I just want to ask what you wrote in the time capsule. <laughs> <laughs> well, I finished the time capsule. Uh -huh. The part that they interrupted me Oh, you me finished on. it. You never yes. said what you put in the letter, though, did No. You? What, I was, what I was using it for was to illustrate that how the thought had come to me that, yes, there is a future and there are people that are going to be talking about what did we do? How did we affect their lives, good or bad? Mm -hmm. And it was when that, going down the coast that day, and it really happened, that I had that thought about, golly, I wonder if it's going to look like this. And, 
And with that came a whole new approach to the letter. I said, wait a minute. I was just going to write about things here as if those people hadn't heard about them. Well, through history, they're going to know all about us. And when I, I said, this letter's got to be different than anything I had conceived of as yet. So from then, I of course had to write about our times, but then I thought I could write about things they wouldn't know about what was our thinking about this and how did we view the future and what we were doing now as to what it might uh, affect them and so forth. But no, the part, of the, the part of the thing that they stopped me on was when I had turned to the young people and was going to say that our responsibility uh, all of us, and, and then I put it, my generation and those several generations between mine and theirs, the, the kids, the responsibility we had to turn over the right kind of a country to them. And my tagline was going to be that we have a sacred responsibility to, when it is their turn, to hand them an America that is free in a world that is at peace. And uh, I didn't get to say it, so I've been saying it to the kids oh, out there on the trip. <laughs> what is it about you that, that uh, turns these kids on on the college campuses? I mean, it's like a Michael Jackson rally, almost. <laughs> um, well, uh, you're asking a, I don't know whether you're asking an authority on that, because as a governor, I was in the era in which if I went to a campus, the, uh, uh, I started a riot mm -hmm. and, uh, in those days. And uh, to suddenly find this attitude in the part of young people, it's, I must say, sometimes I, I get a lump in my throat out there at seeing them and having, feeling them that way. But I've tried to ask some young people, uh, just like I get an individual and say, you know, what is it, why? And, and the answer I get from them is they're interested now in their future. And they think that what we've been doing is right, that their future is safer and better, and uh, they've got a chance for careers and jobs. I guess they're, uh, they weren't too young to have recognized that talk about l an era of limits and things aren't going to be as good as they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, they have hope and optimism. President, we appreciate it very much. We, at one point, we're going to try to hope to talk with you a little bit about some specific things for the second term, but as, as Paul Laxall told us once, you don't like to tempt your Irish superstition in these sorts of circumstances. Yeah. So we're happy to, to forego that and keep our okay. fingers crossed. Hope we have a chance a little bit later. But uh, we right. appreciate it very much. Well, my pleasure. Is this yours or mine? That's mine. That's your, I won't try to turn it off. I don't understand mechanical no, things. I'm sorry to say.